Biology is the study of living things. So how many different living species do you actually think there are on Earth and in the ocean? What would be your estimate? Well, there was a group of scientists that published a paper back in 2011, and they estimated that the number of species on Earth and in the ocean was around 8.7 million. And that's quite a staggering number when you consider the fact that, according to the paper, 86% of the species on Earth and 91% of species in the ocean are still awaiting discovery and description. In fact, there's new species that are being discovered all the time, and an organisation called the International Institute for Species Exploration publishes a, a top 10 list on their website, which you can check out on this link here. And it's got all sorts of weird and wonderful facts about new species. So biology is an ever-expanding field of science, which makes it a very exciting thing to study. So despite the fact that there's such a huge diversity of species on Earth, from microscopic bacteria all the way through to the giant blue whales, all living things have certain common characteristics, such as the ability to move, even though that movement might be somewhat limited in some cases, to grow, to replicate and reproduce, to detect and respond changes in their environment, to take in food or matter and process that in order to generate energy, to remove waste, and the focus of this particular video is that all parts of living things are either made of cells or of the non-cellular products of cells. So cells can actually make products such as chitin which forms the hard shell or the hard exoskeleton of many insects. The mucus which forms uh, the secreted slimy layer on the back of this frog and even keratin which forms our fingernails. These are all examples of non-cellular products. In addition, all living things produce substances that can help them live, such as this spider which spins a web made of silk to help it predate. These bees which use wax to build the honeycomb structure that forms their hive, or even the calcium carbonate that's secreted by this nautilus to form its ornate and protective shell. These are all things that help these animals live. So cells are the basic unit of life, and this means that all organisms are made of cells, and that cells are considered to be the basic structural and functional unit of an organism. This is because cells are easily recognisable packages surrounded by a cell membrane. So let's just say you were to look at uh, the skin on your arm under a microscope. You might see an image that looks very similar to this, and this is a group of cells that are linked together to form a tissue. And around each of the cells, you'll find something called a cell membrane, which I'm outlining now. There's one cell with a cell membrane. Here's another one here, and another one here. And that is the cell membrane. Now the cell membrane forms a boundary between what is considered the internal environment of the cell and the external environment of the cell. Now in this particular case the external environment could be considered uh, the air or the atmosphere on the outside of your skin of your arm. However it can also be considered the space between the cells which is referred to as the intercellular space. So that's why cells are considered the basic structural and functional unit of an organism. Now this cell, like many others, has various parts inside of it that carry out different jobs and carry out a range of different specialised functions. For example, different parts of the cell can take in simple nutrients and convert these to energy, 
which is vital for the cell's survival and for the organism's survival. They can take in and use oxygen and excrete carbon dioxide in a process known as cellular respiration. And they can also reproduce itself and stores uh, a set of instructions in order to do this in a very important molecule called deoxyribonucleic acid, which fortunately is shortened to DNA. Cells can be found in a huge variety of shapes and sizes depending on their size and function. So let's just say you were to take um, the cells in a human body as an example, you'd find things such as this neuron cell, which forms the basis of your nervous system. You would also find this red blood cell, which helps transport oxygen throughout your body. You'd also find some cardiac muscle cell in your heart. Now, each of these is a type of cell, but they look completely different. And that's because they have different functions. And this is one of the major themes you'll find in, in biology, is that there's a relationship between the structure of a cell or an organism or even organelles, and their function. In other words, what they do, what their job is. So living organisms can consist of just a single cell or of millions of cells organized together into much more complex functional groups. So for example, this bacteria here is a single celled organism. In fact, all bacteria are single-celled organisms. So each of these capsules is uh, a bacteria and they're made of a single cell. This amoeba, which you might find in some pond water, is also an example of a single-celled organism. And we refer to single-celled organisms as unicellular organisms. Uni being one, such as unicycle. Now cells can also organize themselves into much more complex organisms, such as these mushrooms or these koalas. And these are known as multicellular organisms. Multi meaning multiple. So how did we come to learn about cells? Well that's the focus of the next video which explains how people discovered cells and how the cell theory was developed.